All right, I'm going to talk for uh, about an hour, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, and love to hear questions in the box if you'd like to type some in. Everybody's on listen-only mode so that we don't have any background confusion and noise. We've been selling the mobile industrial robots for a few months now. We've got a uh, little bit of training under our belts. We went up to New York to have some factory training. And the slide presentation here is a combination of some of the slides that they provide, but others that uh, I've created based on the time I've spent with customers out in the field. And I see that one of the attendees today is actually uh, going to have a demo in their plant in the next week or so. We've just set that up. So looking forward to seeing you out at your facility. So I'm going to jump through these slides fairly quickly. Again, hit the control panel if you've got any questions. Uh, it's kind of an interesting product that was founded out of Denmark, and they've really done something nice with the shipping container. You slide this shipping container apart, and you can literally drive the robot off of it. The top becomes the ramp to let the robot get out of its packaging. Uh, pretty darn unique. What you're seeing here is some mapping. So he's beginning to map an area for the robot to work in. Some of the uh, menus that you see here are in another language because this is a video from Denmark. But you can see the overlay of the fully autonomous and some of the programming. He's actually programming a location right there. There you see it enable its stopping mechanisms for the safety system. We'll cover some of that here in a moment. There's some specs. Uh, again, the brochure that's downloadable in the handout section has some specs. I'll also flash a couple of the specs up here. Interesting product. I do want to draw a distinction between AGVs and AMRs. The Murr Industrial Robot is an AMR. That's an autonomous mobile robot. It doesn't need any wires on the floor. It has an onboard array of sensors that allow it to understand its current location in comparison to the maps that are programmed inside of it. So if you need to reroute or you need to relay out a pathway for this device, it's very quick and easy. You go into the software, you click and create some new points and create some new paths between them. There's there's no, no mechanical things that need to happen on the floor itself. This slide's really just to show you some development work along the way uh, for this particular product line. The company is founded by the same person or group of people who founded Universal Robots, one of the first big market hitting collaborative robots. Uh, so Niels Joel Jacobson uh, is one of those guys. Their company was bought out, you may or may not know this, but Universal Robots was bought out by one of their customers who really wanted to use that product as a CNC load and unload robot. They continue to sell it in the open marketplace, but it is owned by someone other than the original founders. Those original founders, a bunch of bright guys, a lot of background in robotics, still had a lot of energy and wanted to impact the market in other ways and began to create the platform that we're going to talk about here today. Here's a quick spec sheet. I think some of the biggies are that top surface area. That's important because if you're going to build a shelf or something to place on top of it, this is a mobile platform, so you can put things on top of it, shelves and racks and a variety of different things. You'll see some of those examples here. Some of the battery life specs. That maximum speed's a little deceptive. That 1.5 meters per second is part of a specification based on collaborative robots. If this robot in your plant is going to be operating at some point in time in an area that has no people, a back hallway or something that's only used uh, by robots, you can increase that speed to about double that. See the grade that it can take, the length, width, height, etc. The uh, payload of this thing is 100 kilograms, so it's 220 pounds vertically downward on the device. And it can also tow with the hook assembly, which we'll get into, uh, 660 or 300, 300 kilograms. You see down at the bottom, available protocols, wireless, Bluetooth, and REST. We'll get into a couple of those as well. Here's the guts. So if I lift the cover off of that robot, here's kind of what I see, and I'm going to 
fly around this thing and show you what's what. This guy out here is a 3D camera that's helped to uh, look for obstructions that are in front of the device. You've got two, one at each of the two corners here, uh, SICK brand laser safety scanners along with a SICK safety PLC here. That helps it meet all of its compliance regulations for Category 3 operation inside of your plant. They're also used to help navigate the product. So once you load a map on board in combination with this sensor out here and these laser sensors as well as encoders on the two gear motors, it understands where it is on the map and is constantly getting feedback from those laser scanners based on the walls and things around it and its pre-programmed map. So it's comparing those two to be sure that it knows where it's at. The blue device down here is the battery charger. This is a single battery that's sitting in here. It comes standard with a single battery, although there is an option and space for an additional battery that will add additional uh, time and for the unit to be used on the floor without charging. This is a sound sensor or sound cannon. It's a large speaker system. It allows you to play wave files. It can honk, it can beep, it can say things to people. Uh, you can download wave files into the product and play them whenever you'd like. You got some power supplies, you got some power contactors, in here is a drive system and it's covered by a metal cage to keep the noise away from the other products. Uh, down underneath this bar, you can't really see it right now, is an embedded computer. It's a uh, Intel Nook computer system that helps to run the device and down over here is a wireless unit and that wireless unit actually has two channels, one that you get on to program with, and the second channel allows it to connect to the local LAN. And I'll show you an example of that. I've got a unit just outside my office attached to our local LAN that I'll be able to communicate with. So that's kind of the basic layout of the unit. Uh, one interesting thing is their docking station just like a Roomba robot, it can go and charge itself up. The docking station itself incorporates a VL shape, and I'll get into that more on the next slide to help it very accurately locate itself. And then it's got a couple of compressible spring-loaded pins here. So the deal is that the robot finds this shape, this VL marker shape, accurately positions itself. There's a couple of small metal plates on the front of the robot that are exposed. It pulls up into position, compresses those two spring-loaded pins, sets a small signal back through those to be sure that it's got full continuity, and then sets its relay charge on and uh, begins a charging process. Uh, this is the VL marker shape that's a part of that. Uh, it has other uses as well. The VL marker can be used anytime you want to accurately position the robot. I'll give you an example. You could load, you could, could put on top of this robot a small section of conveyor and use it to shuttle parts from one part of the building to another and then move them onto a different conveyor. You'd want that to be accurately located so that you don't dump that load of parts out onto the floor. VL marker is ideal for that. In repeatability testing that I have done, I'm seeing plus or minus one centimeter of differential position on each of the corners uh, when I check the position after I've used the VL marker to initiate the final docking position. So very accurate positioning with this thing. The 3D sensor on the front, you can see a little image from it down here. It allows the unit to see a variety of obstructions and things well ahead of where it's going to be, begin to slow down if it needs to, and then enable the safety system as appropriate with the two six safety laser scanners. You've got two gear motors on this unit, and each one of them has an encoder, and those are also used to help in navigation and tracking of position on the map. You got a gyro up here on top. That was the yellow thing in the picture on a previous page. Just back up to that page one time. The gyro is right here, that yellow box up on top. In normal operation, the unit's lights change color to let you know what it's doing. So if in the event somebody walks over in front of it and it stops, that the lighting will turn red, indicating that it went into a stop position because of a safety obstruction. 
green indicates it's ready for a job, et cetera, et cetera. So it does have a pattern of colors to tell you what's going on. You also have the ability, as I said, to make sounds. Uh, wave files can be loaded into it. And good example of the use of both the lighting and the wave files. Perhaps you come through an intersection on a regular basis and you want to alert fork truck and people traffic to the presence of your device as it passes through that intersection. You can create an area event. That area event can cause the lighting on the unit to change as well as a horn or a beeping sound to occur while it's passing through that intersection. This is a kind of a forward looking, what's this industry all about and where's it going? They invested in this particular technology because they have a strong belief that it's going to become very popular just as the collaborative robots have on regular factory floor use. And just to back that up a little bit, I've pulled a couple of slides from some locations. This again, looking at their growth. This is one slide I pulled uh, from YouTube. And this is a company by the name of Kiva that was bought by Amazon. They've got now thousands of these in plants and these robots go out and pick up, they'll pick up some shelf units, they'll bring that shelf unit back to the person who's creating orders. So that person right there was able to just grab a part off when it was appropriate, stuff it into the package and get it shipped out. So, uh, you know, Amazon's just somebody who gets ahead of costs and they believe in this technology. They've invested 775 million in buying this company and then more in some software development to be tailored to their specific needs. Uh, here's another example. It's a company called Starship out of the UK. These are devices that are delivering home groceries. You put a couple of bags of groceries in this thing and you give it the coordinates for somebody who's just placed an order. It pulls up to their door. They've got a code on their smartphone that allows that to be opened. They grab the groceries out and the thing goes back to the grocery store for refill. Another robot manufacturer who you might locally or might have heard of is KUKA. Uh, KUKA has also created a device for this market space, a little bigger and heavier duty, uh, but nonetheless an industrial device for moving product around on the factory floors. Now I'm going to kind of get into the how you set this thing up after you've gotten out of the box, what you do with it. And this layout shows you really the process that we go through in order to get this thing up and running in a factory. So the first step will connect wirelessly to the device. And literally you take out your smartphone, you create a wireless connection to the thing, you open up a browser, you jump in and you're off and running with this thing. It's it's very easy to begin using with. Then you got to create a map. I equate this to a TomTom -tom straight off the shelf that doesn't have a North American map on it. It's not much good. After you get it into a factory location, you've got to do some manual mapping or alternatively, you can download maps from CAD into the unit after some transformation into a PNG file. But I recommend mapping the factory floor itself because the factory floor has obstacles that aren't going to be on your CAD map that were was the building without anything in it. So after we walk it around, it doesn't take long to walk around an area and create a map. We do a little map editing. That's cleaning up things like fork trucks that were detected while we were mapping, people that were detected while we were mapping. And it's also creating some boundaries where the robot shouldn't go. People might be working around a cell rather than having it dart through a cell. You want to cordon that off by just drawing a little line saying, don't go through that area. Next step is we will teach some positions, and I'll go through these steps in more detail. Teach some positions on the map. I want you to pick up product over here. I want you to take it over to quality control over here so it can be inspected. So you literally touch points on the map and say, I want to create this position, and I want to call it quality control or line one finish or whatever I want to call them. 
and then you build your missions. I want it to go over to quality control. I want it to wait for five minutes while people take stuff off of it. I want it to return back over to line one, whatever that might look like. And we'll go into some of the, the options there in the mission build. And then you simply run the mission. So begin by mapping. You go into the software and you say new map and then it creates this little shape you're seeing on the screen here with a little blue box indicating that's its current position. And then you move your thumb around in this gray space just like a joystick and the robot responds by moving in kind and while it's moving it's using its encoders and the two laser scanners to create the map that it's going to use to navigate. So in this start that you see right here. It's parked kind of over in a tight corner, but you can see the laser safety scanner see a big open area in a variety of patterns and will navigate over to those and begin to fill in that data values. So here's kind of an area that's been mapped and you can see there's some archive information here. This is where somebody was standing around while the mapping was going on. So is this. Uh, this is an area where some people have desks that I probably want to keep the robot from going into. You got an area here where a doorway was open into an area that's not going to be a part of the area used by the robot. So I'm going to put a little red line there saying don't go over there. But this is kind of what the raw map looks like. And you see you've got an upload and a download button right here. It's a good idea at this point to download the map to your PC. So you've got all the data that was originally taken from the map location. And you can use that again later in future projects and future missions. So you can download it. Of course, you've got an upload button as well. If you want to do the editing in a separate software package like Paint, because you're going to see this interface is very much like a Paint interface, you can do that offline in a Paint software and then upload the final map back into the unit using the upload button. <coughs> so this is the editor that's inside the software itself. And again, you're just operating through a Chrome browser at this point. So there's no software that's on your PC or your phone. It's all on the device and it's being served up by a web server. So I'd go into this and I would hit this button up here, which would have been labeled activate editing. And then I begin to touch on say the word forbidden and I would draw a line across this open doorway and I would draw a line around this area here to keep it away from the people that are operating in these desks. I might put a preferred line in that's a green color and tell it hey, I'd really like you to use this route through here and down through here, etc. I might click on the available and clean up these fragments of where people were standing. So that's the kind of stuff you do in an editing. So I'd edit these things out, draw my red lines. You see here an example of another map from another area where we've drawn some red lines, given it forbidden zones or no-go zones. I don't want it to wander down this hallway, etc. So now it's got a bounded area that it's going to operate in. After you've edited the map, then you create some positions. And you'd go into the command view area of the software, and I'll show you where that is live here in a minute. And I literally go down here and hit create a new position. And I can either, this little box right here pops up, I can use the current robot position. So if the robot is currently in one of the positions I want to create, I can name it whatever I'd like, click on the button, use robot position, and then one of these little blue circles pops up with an arrow. The arrow indicates the forward direction of the robot itself. So that spot on the map has been created and the robot knows where that is. Uh, this particular map is the area down around our technical support area. And you can see where I have right clicked on a particular location, this one right here. And when that happens in the software, it tells you the name of the point and you can either edit it or you can just tell the robot to take a mission and go there right now. So it's an easy way of taking a smartphone out and telling the robot to go to another position within your facility. 
Then you create missions, and I've just snapshotted some of the options under creating missions. The most often used item in here is probably this move to a known position. We already talked about creating positions on the map. And this simply allows it to move to one of those known positions. You see a docking, so it could go over and go to a dock position. And that dock position could either be a charging station or it could be a VL marker accurately positioning it against a conveyor, as I talked about earlier. Switch maps. The switch map is most often used when you're doing a multi-level facility. So it's got Bluetooth capabilities to communicate with the current modern day Bluetooth uh, control modules that are inside of elevators and it could take itself to another uh, layer in the building, another floor, and then as it gets to that other floor you'd have to switch a map so that it knows what's going on on that particular floor and what it should expect. Play a sound, we talked about being able to beep or honk or actually play audio files. Show a light. You could change lighting. So I pull up in an area where I'm expecting somebody to load it. I could beep, throw some lights up there, let the person begin to take care of the loading or unloading. Load mission list. <clears throat> Excuse me. Load mission list allows you to create a loop. So I might have it running between two or three different points, and I want it to do that all day long. I only have to create those first three points, and then I would call that mission again via the command load mission list. It does offer PLC interface capabilities. They offer a small PLC pre-programmed for I.O. points for registers, and I can look for and wait for PLC registers. I can set those registers as well. Most common thought here is I pull up to a location and I wait, want to wait for someone to hit a button before I move to the next point on the map. There's an easy way I can wait for a PLC register. A PLC register goes true. I take off from my next position. Since the unit has the ability to connect to a local LAN, it has the ability to send text messages and emails. So if you'd like it to pull up to a location and text someone to let them know that it's there, it can certainly do that as well. Each time you place one of these items into the mission list, it needs more information. So what you would do is you would click on that command that you loaded into the mission list, in this case move to a known position. You'd use this drop down box to select the position that you wanted to go to. Likewise if you had a change in lighting effect, you would drop this box open, you would tell it I want to blink or I want to strobe or I want to chase lights and you would tell it what colors and how long those sorts of things. So it's, it's pretty straightforward in how you modify the things that you want it to do. There is a simulation package for this product. It runs under VMware. Uh, the system itself, like the Universal Robot, runs on a Linux operating system. And in order to simulate that, you do need VMware. You see a snapshot here of VMware running the MER sim on an Oracle VM virtual box. And then you have access to all of the software commands for training. It already has some simulated maps loaded. And so inside of that simulator, you can literally do anything you can do in the general software, except create a new map of an area that you currently haven't visited pretty handy. I, I use it during my demonstrations just to get an idea, give the people an idea of what they're going to see when we're out on the floor. A door control module. This is a, a Bluetooth module. The unit has Bluetooth on board and look at the picture off to the right and you see this coming down a hallway and it's opened these doors for itself. So I can create what's called an area event maybe five or six feet on either side of the set of doors where during that period of time it outputs a signal to the Bluetooth module and this Bluetooth module is literally mounted right here on top of that door and when it gets the signal it just closes a contact and provides the power necessary to open this door and allow it to pass through. Same thing on the way back. Uh, the hook assembly 
used to pull carts around. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit more. I've got some slides and some pictures and some close-ups of this. Um, but it's got a couple of linear actuators, 24 volt linear actuators. This one here raises the whole hook assembly up and down. Uh, this one back here clamps on to the cart itself. Uh, you've also got a assembly right here that is a brake assembly. That brake assembly helps to lock the hook into its center position as it's driving along without a cart. So you don't want it to be driving along without a cart and have this thing flopping because it'll turn a corner. This thing will spin out and hit somebody or a wall. So it locks itself into position when it's running without a cart. When it does have a cart on board, it allows it to swing just like a trailer. And because of an encoder up in this area here, it knows where that cart is tracking behind it. This is a little card I use in some demos with our hook assembly. Just wanted to point out a couple of things. One is that the clamp itself needs to have a square channel or bar down at the bottom in order to clamp onto. It's the way that that hook shape is created. In this card, I just modified it. I took a piece of a half inch channel, aluminum channel, drilled it, put it in place, and it's more than adequate to be able to pull that around. Uh, the other thing that you may or may not notice in the videos, if I play a video with a cart, is this QR code. The QR code is important on the cart for a lot of different reasons. One is it identifies the particular cart, so it's got some information encoded in it, and it's easy to create these QR codes with QR code generators that are available on the web. The other is it's got information encoded into it that tells the size of the code itself. That helps because when you go to pick up a cart, it's not going to be perfectly located each time. The, the MER itself will get in a position where it should pick up a cart. It will use its rear-facing 2D camera. It will identify the code and also notice how large it is. So this particular code you're looking at says 3IN-CART22. So the 3IN is the dimension. It's a 3-inch by 3-inch code. So once the MER reads that, then it can accurately position itself for pickup because it knows what its depth of field looks like based on how large that code appears in the 2D camera relative to the 3-inch information that's embedded in the code. Uh, here are some close-up pictures of parts of the hook. This is the linear actuator that's used to raise and lower that hook's position. You've got an e-stop up on top for safety. Uh, this is the rear-facing 2D camera and illumination system that allows it to read those 2D codes. Uh, this is the linear actuator that's used to clamp. And you'll see out here is one part of the hook assembly another part of the hook assembly for clamping, and then the third, the stud there, the thick metal part. So the bar is laid right into here. This is driven down into position. Once the current spikes on the motor for this linear actuator, Murr understands that it does indeed have a cart in its grasp. If it, for one reason or another, failed to pick the cart, let's say somebody moved it away after it had pulled into position, it knows by the lack of a spike in the current draw for that particular linear actuator that it didn't pick, then it pulls back forward again, relooks at where the card is, and does another uh, attempt at picking that card up. Uh, pretty neat system. Uh, I'm impressed with the capabilities of it. This is a little close up of that brake assembly. It's also got an encoder in, as I said, that notes what the position of the arm is. So after it's parked the cart, the last move that the robot makes is put it in the linear position or straight back from the robot itself and locks it up before releasing that cart. A little picture under the hood of the front of the hook. You notice there's another uh, embedded computer, non-rotating media, another Intel Nook PC here, some drivers for the brakes and the solenoids on the uh, two linear actuators. And then up front, it's got another 3D camera. And that's because the other 3D camera doesn't look high enough to look for obstructions that the hook might run into. So this 3D camera looks above the surface where the other cameras are focused, looking for obstructions that the hook assembly might bump itself on throughout the facility. Play one of these real quick. Here it is driving with one of those trolleys. 
and they do call them trolleys. That's a European word for cart. See the blue light indicating that it's on a mission. You see the little QR code that was on the front of it. Here's another little one where it's backing into a position. This is where we got the title of our webinar. You see the 2D code right there, identifies the cart. It also gives it information as to the size of the code so it can help position itself accurately when going to pick up. And like in any good parking maneuver, uh, when it does start backwards, it starts a beeping sound. Uh, fleet control. There is a software package for use in plants where there are multiple robots in use. And it's a software and hardware combination package. The hardware is another one of those embedded Nook computers from Intel that has the operating software for the fleet control. It plugs into your local LAN so that you've got a good hard connection to the local LAN. And then each of the robots is also attached to that LAN, and they're placed in groups based on what they have on top of them. Here's what I mean. Let's say in a plant we've got three robots with shelf units on top and three robots on with hooks on top. We don't want to send a shelf unit over to something that needs a hook to be able to pull a cart. So we classify them, the jobs are called according to what sort of robot is needed, and they're moved into position based on their proximity to the job as well as their current charge level. Uh, units have the ability to automatically go to charging when they reach a certain charge level, and they decrease to a certain amount and that allows them to go back, begin their charging cycle, and the fleet software then calls the next available robot into service for that job. I don't know if there's any questions or comments at this point. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift a little bit and I'm going to go over uh, to uh, the actual interface. This is the interface of the MER robot that's sitting out in front of my office. I just currently told it to go up to this position here which is in front of our controller's office, Bob's, and you can see that it created a pathway that it's going to navigate. So all, all I'm going to do is go up here and hit the continue button, and when I hit the continue button, it's literally walking up the hallway to come to rest in a position in front of Bob's office. Now you notice that I've already named this point and created one. It's called near my office. I could just as easily create a point out here in space. So let's go ahead and create a new position. We're going to create a new position and I'm going to call it Katrina's office. Katrina heads up our customer service efforts. And instead of using the current robot position, I'm going to choose it on the map. I'm going to go over here. This is Katrina's office right here. I'm going to go over here and just draw a dot. So as soon as I hit my mouse cursor, it creates the center of the location. And as I'm holding my mouse and I drag, I'm dragging a line indicating the direction I want that robot pointed when it hits that position. So it put that data value in here. It filled out that spot based on the map position I chose. I just hit the create button and I've created a new position and if I wanted it to go there I say go to 
it automatically begins to calculate the route to Katrina's office and it begins on its way. Now, I don't see anybody roaming the hall right now, but if you uh, watch the screen here and somebody pops into the hallway, you'll see the safety laser scanners begin to pick them up. Uh, I didn't notice anybody there, but you'll see arcs of red indicating that there's somebody in place. This little arc of red that's here right now is a new potted plant that we just put in place. I'm going to tell it to uh, go to my office, and again, it calculates how it needs to get to that position, starts its maneuvering, and heads back to my office. So a pretty straightforward interface in terms of the use of the product. Now, if you notice up in my address bar up here at the top, it says 192.168.3.72. That is the address that was served, DHCP, by our internal LAN. It, as well as my computer, are both on the internal LAN. So if I go down here and look at my wireless settings, you see I'm on CE Customer 2. That customer uh, network runs throughout the building. So when I do training in-house on this unit, I will leave this unit up here on this level in the building while I'm training down in another level of building and be able to run these same kinds of missions and trainings. So I'll look at the uh, menu system a little bit, just kind of plug and chug through it for a few minutes so you can see. The area that I was in right there is under service and command view. That's the area that I use quite often. And when I'm doing a customer demonstration, I generally open up two different windows at the same time. I open up another window that is the mission window that tells you where it's been and where it's going and what's its next step in the mission. So it's easy to open a separate tab and have the same communication to that unit. Here in the home screen, you'll also see current battery life. You'll also see the ability to put it into a manual mode. So at any time, you can put this thing in a manual mode. This is enable, disable. I can enable the unit, and if you were uh, here with me looking out the uh, window of my office to the hallway, you'd see that as I move it like this forward, it's starting to walk down the hallway. So forward is this direction, backward is this, left, right, as you're behind the unit following it. If you decide to walk it around your plant with the uh, a smartphone, I do recommend you lock your screen or hold it in the upright position so that the screen doesn't rotate and what you think is forward now becomes left or right and you run it into a wall. Here's the mission area. So I can create and put missions in a queue. So it does one mission, does another mission, and I can create missions from up here. Here's the mission interface to creation. So I can create one called New Seminar. And then here are all the options. I can put in Move to a Known Position. I can uh, play a sound once I get to that new position. I can do a little wait. And then I can move to another known position. Those, as I'm double clicking on them, get populated into this mission list. And then I need to further define each of those steps because they're empty right now. What position do I want to move to? I want to move to the position near Bob's office. Once I get there, what kind of sound do I want to play? One of my favorites is Good Morning Vietnam by Robin Williams. Well, this thing is pretty loud, so if I play that at 100% over by my controller's office, he's liable to jump out of his skin. So I'm going to take it down to about a 4% volume level. He'll still be able to hear it. I'm going to have it wait there for 10 seconds. And then I'm going to have it move over to Katrina's office. And I'm going to save that. Now, if I wanted this to be in a loop, I could have added one more command at the end of that. And I could have had it say load mission list. So I double click on that.
And under the load mission list, I select the same mission that I just created, new seminar, and then it's going to constantly loop between those points. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to have it run this mission one time. So I'm going to hit cancel. So it has the th first three steps that we put down in that, which are move to a known position by Bob's office, play the sound, wait, and then move to Katrina's office. So under mission, I'm going to select that mission that we just created called new seminar. And I'm going to add the mission to the mission list, and I'm going to tell it to continue. Again, I usually open up a separate window for this, but I'll just go and open up the command view. You see where it's already almost all the way up to Bob's office. It's going to stop there. There you saw in the red arcs behind it, somebody walking around. That's probably Bob walking around behind the unit into his office. Well, somebody, yeah, he walked all the way around it and into his office. So it played that sound bite there. It's going to wait for that period of time based on that timer create its move to the next location in the mission. So that's a quick and easy look at what a mission start stop looks like. At any point during a mission you can open up a smart device and you can halt that mission by simply hitting the stop button up here. You can see a variety of maps are already stored on board from past demonstrations. I could pull any of those maps up, edit them, bring them into active navigation as I needed. Well, that's 45 minutes. That's probably as long as I'm going to go today, just to give you a brief overview on the product. Uh, if you have a question, type it down in the uh, control panel box, and I'd be happy to to answer that. <clears throat> also like to give you my uh, cell phone number if you'd like to call, ask a specific question, I'd be happy to run through that with you. My cell phone number is 937-902-9219.